Okay, welcome to you all. Welcome back, both of those of you here in the audience uh, in Cambridge and those of you watching at home. Um, he's been, in the last two weeks, he's been to Norway, Mexico, most recently Berlin, and now, thank goodness, we have him here, here in Cambridge. So, uh, I want to introduce to you Professor Tim Benton. Uh, Professor Benton is Dean of Strategic Research Initiatives at the University of Leeds, but he's also the Distinguished Visiting Fellow, uh, visiting fellow at the Energy, Environment and Resources Department at the Royal Institute of International Affairs at Chatham House in London. He's involved with field research on how farming drives ecological dynamics and how food system resilience responds to climate threats, and he's involved in research all the way around the world on those topics. From 2011 to 2016, he was the champion of the UK's Global Food Security Programme. That was a multi-agency partnership of the UK's public bodies that have some interest in the challenges around food. And their key role was to identify the research priorities to mitigate the challenges of providing sufficient, sustainable and nutritious diets. He's published more than 150 academic papers, many on the topics of agriculture and its sustainability, and his particular interest is currently on food system resilience in the face of climate change. So please give a very warm welcome to our main speaker tonight, Professor Tim Benton. Thank you very much, and um, severe apologies for my delay today. I was at a G20 meeting in Berlin, and I couldn't get out of it, and... Um, the inbound plane was delayed by thunderstorms at Heathrow, and by the time the plane arrived and we got onto it, there were thunderstorms in Berlin, and they shut the airport. And so, I, of course, I arrived two hours late into London, and then it was rush hour, and we crawled up the M25. So I'm... Yeah. <laughs> I am frazzled today. But let's switch to the topic. And, uh, and I'll come back to those thunderstorms later, because those thunderstorms are an example of... Um, climate change. The incidence of thunderstorms and extreme weather events uh, is, is a, a, an example of what we have to come to expect. It's not just droughts and um, major changes in the climate, it is changes in the day-to-day -day weather that's going to make a difference to our lives, as I have found today. So uh, um, I'm going to talk uh, probably for three quarters of an hour or so around this issue of climate change and how it impacts upon agriculture, but how also agriculture and food impact upon climate change, and then think a little bit about the future of agriculture and th the future of our food systems. Um, I am not, de I'm deliberately not going to focus very tightly on agriculture and uh, the kind of mechanisms by which we can respond as a sector to climate change, because what is needed for me at the moment is relatively uncertain for reasons that I will explain. So, to start off with a little bit of primer on, on uh, climate change. So, climate change is caused by greenhouse gases. And greenhouse gases, there are a whole range of greenhouse gases. Carbon dioxide is the one that most people focus on. And that's mainly because once it's up in the atmosphere, it stays in the atmosphere for thousands of years. The next biggest greenhouse gas is methane, of course, which has a very strong agricultural component. And that has largely been ignored by the climate change community, not deliberately, but because once it goes up into the atmosphere, it only stays for its half-life is 12 years or something like that. So it doesn't stay for very long. So if we stopped growing cows, for example, in 20 years' time, the methane that's been caused by climate change would lar will largely disappear. But if we grow more cows, then clearly it becomes an important... Um, uh, cause of climate change. And then the other major greenhouse gas is the various nitrous oxides. And of course, one of the major drivers of these, this is agriculture. So use of synthetic fertilizers, vol the vol volatilization of the, the ammonia creates nitrous oxides. And when the government talks about polluted cities and the impact of, of pollution on uh, people's health and livelihoods in cities. At the moment, diesel cars are getting the blame for the pollution, but actually about a third of the nitrous oxides in cities comes from agriculture. So it is the, pest the, the uh, nit nitrogen fertilizer that's put on the fields, creates nitrous oxides, and that drifts into cities. So greenhouse gases and their causes. And as you can see from these graphs, so this is 
uh, recent one, roughly speaking, over my lifetime. This is the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere um, as measured on the top of a volcano in Hawaii. And then this is over the last 800,000 years um, from a variety of different um, uh, measurement schemes. But what you can see is clearly, this is last week, we are entering realms of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which are completely unprecedented in recent historical times. So we create carbon dioxide, we create greenhouse gases, they go up into the atmosphere, and cumulatively their proportion is growing. And I learned about, so I'm in my 50s, I'm in my 50s now, I learned about um, greenhouse gases and the greenhouse effect at school. And effectively, all that happens within the atmosphere is what happens in a greenhouse. So you get shortwave radiation coming in, heats up the ground, gets reflected as long-wave radiation, you know, far, far infrared. And that reflection, because it's long-wave radiation, tends to get bounced back by things in the atmosphere. And in the greenhouse, it's the glass that bounces it back, so it keeps the heat inside. In the atmosphere, atmosphere, it is things like water, but the greenhouse gases. So we've known for, for donkey's years that if you put carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, it acts like putting a blanket around the, the Earth, trapping the solar radiation. And this is a tweet from a colleague of mine who tweets under the name of Guy Callender, who was a famous early pioneer of climate change. And this is something from one of his papers in 1938, pointing out that from his back-of-the-envelope analysis, because they didn't have computers in those days, it was all done by hand, that there is already the signal of uh, global warming decades ago, back from the turn of this century, effect, effectively. And the physics of climate change, the physics of, of global warming, is very, very strong, just as the physics of a, green, of a greenhouse is very, very strong, and that's why we grow crops under greenhouse. So <coughs> global warming is the kind of, you put more energy into the earth, you'll tend to warm the earth up. And one of the prime things, of course, is that the temperature's going up. So this is a time series back to 1880, um, with the average here, zero point, being the average of the 20th century. And what you can see is effectively, over time, you have got a very steady increase in average global temperature. Now, I do a lot of statistical modeling, and I would say, if you need statistics to show that that's a pretty linear curve, then you're doing the wrong sort of thing. That, that, that figure should convince anyone, other than Trump, of course. Could you try pressing this? This is a, another way of showing the same data. Sorry, it takes a while to warm up, because um, this is monthly temperatures going round and round and round in all of the years since the 1880s. And just watch, as time goes out, the circle gets bigger and bigger and bigger. up to last year, this, this one around the outside, hottest, hottest ever. But what you can see is monthly temperatures, they start off in the middle, and they expand, and they expand, and they expand. And that expansion, the axis coming out, of course, is the increase in temperature. So global warming is about warming the Earth in general, on average. How does that affect the UK? Well, I put up... Up here, that historically, we've had something that I call a Goldilocks climate. It's uh, not too much, not too little, just right in terms of doing a whole range of different things. So our mean average temperature, the central England temperature, is about 10 degrees. So that's pretty good. That's not too hot, not too cold. Uh, wind speeds, certainly over the southern part of the country, are clement. Um, we have a significant amount of rainfall. We don't tend to worry in the past about rain um, enough at the right sorts of seasons, and it's not too cold. We are moderated very strongly by the, um, the Gulf Stream and the Jet Stream, the kind of water current and the air current, to make a nice all-round climate. But one of the things I think everybody who lives outside, like farming community and ecologists like myself, is noticing, I think, is that the predictability of our seasons are starting to change. And I, and I know when I grew up, um, my kind of uh, honorary grandfather, who lived a few streets away, was a shepherd in Hampshire. And 
So this was in the 70s. He was 80, so he, he was born at the turn of the last century. He used to have a shelf of old almanacs, agricultural almanacs, and when I was bored, I used to leaf through them. And I can remember now being struck by them saying, oh, you plant on this date, and you harvest on this date, give or take a few days, and a kind of clockworkness about the seasonality. And we tend to think about winter, autumn, spring and summer as seasons that are discrete. And certainly my recollections of the old days was that the seasons are quite discrete. But now I think, and there's data that supports it, anybody who lives outside is recognising that we could have any seasonal weather more or less in any week of the year now. Um, I was talking to someone yesterday who was in, who, who's Russian, and he was complaining that they had significant snow on the 10th of June, which they haven't had for hundreds of years. And that kind of the whole patterns of the seasons and the predictability of the seasons is changing. And we know our temperature, our average temperature is changing in England. This is. Uh, uh, London, Northwest England, and Scotland, and you can see over the last 40 years, especially a, a upward curve in the average temperature. Um, this is a graph of uh, extreme rainfall events, and what you can see since about the 70s is that there has been a gradual increase in the extreme rainfall. And the reason that this matters is that as you put more energy into the atmosphere, it clearly heats up. More energy means that there's more energy to do things. Hotter atmosphere absorbs more water. So when the conditions are right, there is more water to come down, and you would expect more extreme rainfalls, and that's what we're seeing. And one of the things that we have relied on in the past for our clement climate is the jet stream, because the jet stream and the Gulf Stream between them bring all of this regularity of this maritime weather to us. And the jet stream is effectively this high altitude circulation. And what has been noticeable over the last few years is that the jet stream, which is normally relatively circular, has started to become more meandering. And as it meanders, these are called Rossby waves, as it meanders, it creates pockets of in some cases, very, very cold air. This is the polar vortex that has been very prominent in the United States for a few years. And if it becomes meandering enough and it buds off this, then you end up with a cyclone, a strong storm. And one of the reasons that it's becoming more meandery is because as the temperature differential between the north and the equator gets less. So the Arctic ice is melting. We know the Arctic ice is melting will be ice-free within a few decades. As it melts, the north goes from being white to being black, the colour of the sea. And that means it absorbs more heat rather than reflects more heat. So the north is heating up very quickly relative to the tropics. And that's reducing the temperature differential between the tropics and the north. And that temperature differential means that the jet stream becomes weaker because the jet stream is being driven by the temperature extremes. And so one of the things that affects us in the UK particularly is that we are very, very sensitive to the position of the jet stream. And the thing that's undermining our climate predictability is we don't know whether we're going to be receiving lots of cold air from the north when the jet stream's in one position or in another position we're receiving hot air from the south. And this really does affect our climate in all seasons. So in 2013-14, we had a really wet winter. Well, we've had so many really wet winters. We, we, have, we had a really wet winter. You might remember it. Aberystwyth was uh, almost washed away. But the characteristic of the 2013-14 was that the jet stream was in a, such a position um, that the, we were effectively at the end of the conveyor belt of the major storms. And these are different storms, the L's for low pressure, throughout the winter. And we had week after week where we had very severe storms. And instead of the storms passing north of us like they used to do, that year they passed straight through the middle of us and they created so much damage. So the position of the jet stream in winter is important. Uh, can you um, play the video? 
This is the following winter. Um, this is a, a video I took from my, my home. This is a field wall that has filled up with water. And this is just uh, what would normally be a very small beck, and this is my local road that drives across there, and that's one of my dogs. Um, but that was completely unprecedented, because this road had apparently never flooded in living memory, and it flooded, and if, if it weren't for that wall at the start holding back the water, it would have uh, washed away a whole lot of the infrastructure further downstream. And again, that was driven like 2013-14. This is the Boxing Day floods, so this is Boxing Day. Um, that was driven by the positioning of the jet stream. So that's winter. Then in spring, we've had a succession of different springs. So 2012, it was one of the hottest springs ever. Here is a temperature map in 2012. And in 2013, it was one of the coldest uh, late springs, late winters ever, and many hill farmers lost thousands of sheep at this time. I remember, so where I live in the bottom of the Yorkshire Dales, it's a little lane that's three miles from the nearest town, and we had six foot snowdrifts over two miles of that up on the moor, and we were blocked in for five days, and this was late March, and I was supposed to be in Defra at a meeting on extreme weather, and I had to ring up and say, the weather's so extreme, I can't come, <laughs> which was, uh, it, it kind of made my point. But, but the difference between 2012 and 2013 was driven by the meandering of the jet stream. And it matters in summer, too. So this is 2012. This is uh, a temperature map for 2012, where it's red, it's much hotter than normal, where it is um, blue, it's colder than normal. And what you can see in 2012 is very hot in the Midwest, very hot in Eastern Europe. We had our dry, uh, wettest summer ever, the summer that never was. Um, and then there were floods and monsoon in the monsoon belt over in um, India, Pakistan. And one of the things that worries me about our global food system and its resilience is that when I first started working for the government, they said, don't worry about weather as a factor of climate change, because if it's bad weather in one place, it will generally be good weather somewhere else. And what we have learnt through the meandering of the jet stream is that if it's bad weather in one place, it's likely to be bad weather in many places. And that means the risk of having uh, multiple breadbasket failure impacting on many of the places that produce food simultaneously is much higher than we thought it was five years ago. And this is just a map, to get a bit agricultural for a minute, this is a map of where the major calories in the world are produced. So uh, maize, soya, wheat, uh, rice, and uh, palm oil are effectively the major uh, calorie crops. And as you can see, they're relatively concentrated in space. I mean, clearly the rest of the world produces a degree of calories, but that's where the bulk of the commodity crops come. And this map for 2012 is quite frightening, because if it's a little bit worse than it was in 2012, you could imagine significant impacts on yields in all of those different places, and that would really be a uh, determinant of food prices on a global basis. <clears throat> so climate change is the general warming of the climate, but how it impacts upon us is not just through general warming. And th this is a map from the Met Office of what a four-degree world would look like. And what you can see is that there are different colours all over the place. The ocean will warm up less by typically three degrees. The land will warm up more, so it's five, six, seven, eight. And as you can see, the high latitudes, eight degrees perhaps on, on average. Um, some of the areas, you know, plus seven degrees down here, are already very, very hot. So adding a degree, a, a degree of temperature, like seven degrees, is quite frightening. But I want to emphasize that there are three elements of climate change that we have to consider and will determine what happens in agriculture. The first is the change in climate. So the change in climate. Climate is effectively the average weather over, over a 10, 20, 30 year time period that you would expect. So it's the average. If you take our 10 degrees of central England temperature and add four degrees to it, then effectively it's moving in climate space from England 
to the bottom of France or Barcelona or somewhere like that. So we are on course, post-Paris climate agreement, we're still on course for about three and a half degrees of temperature rise this century. So the first thing is this change in climate. Now, if this happens slowly and in a straightforward linear way, nice and smooth, we can adapt to it. It might not be a pleasant thing to do. If you think about all of the vegetation that surrounds us, most of it wouldn't survive in a highly Mediterranean type climate, which would be an extra four degrees over our 10 degrees average at the moment. But we would adapt. We would have vegetation. We'd be able to grow things. We'd still be able to have livestock. We'd still have water. We would adapt. But there are two other issues to do with climate change, which I've already intimated. The first one is that as the climate changes, so does the weather. And there are a lot of kind of technicalities in what extreme weather is, whether it is more, as in the positioning of the jet stream, not one of those storms was really bad, we just had a lot of them in succession. So it was the cumulative effect of weather in that case. But equally, you can have extreme weather in terms of what, we, what we've been going through this week, which is the hottest temperatures for 40 years at this time of the year. So you can experience hotter and hotter and hotter as extremes. But again, this is some recent data. This happens to be from, from the US, but it could be from anywhere. They just keep some nice data from the 70s through to 2010. This is the uh, incidence of extreme weather that creates some sort of um, damage. And as you can see, again, if you put a straight line regression through it, it's clearly rising. So the climate change of the sort of that we can adapt to, that's gradual, that's investment, that's change over time. What do we do as the weather gets more variable, which is effectively what's happening here? How do we manage that? That is an issue that we haven't really thought enough about within the agricultural community. We have concentrated on the, oh, in general, it's going to get hotter and drier in the summer and, colder, uh, and wetter in the winter. The third element of climate change that we have not, as a community, and even the climate change community, um, have only just started to get to grips with it, is what might happen if there is a large-scale change in our circulation patterns. And we wrote a report, the Global Food Security Programme that I used to lead, we wrote a report that was launched in the House of Lords earlier this year uh, on the resilience of the food system to changes, tipping points, permanent changes, stepwise changes. And one of the ex example changes that might happen that we talked about was there is a, an, uh, the Gulf Stream is driven by an overturning circulation, which effectively acts as a heat conveyor from the tropics to northwest Europe. This drives a lot of the temperature flow. If that turns off, and there is a non-trivial chance, and I mean non-trivial in the sense of 10, 20, 30 percent over the next 50 or 60 years of it turning off, if it turns off, we will lose several degrees of heat that comes from um, the tropics. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But if you look, and when I first put this graph together, it was for a student seminar, I looked to find towns across the other side of the Atlantic that I could use pictures of to visualize what the climate might be like without the Gulf Stream and the overturning circulation. And I couldn't find any, because there aren't any. Because the winters are so long and deep, and growing seasons are so short, and summers are so short, that it's a really, really difficult place to live. And so if we lose the conveyor of heat, then that stepwise change might radically change our long-term climate. And not just in a gradual sense, but it could happen, it could switch off over a period of five to ten years. And that would really reconfigure the way that we would live. Come back to that in a minute. So extreme weather. You all know this. We've, you, barely a day goes past without opening a newspaper or seeing a report or something. So just some stuff that I picked up. Um, I remember in th this period, so October 17th, October 24th, so just a week apart, 
two of the strongest storms ever went through different hemispheres. Um, so over Mexico and through Philippines. We've just come out of the um, very long decadal Californian drought. Boxing Day floods of bridge near me that have been there for several hundred years collapsed. We've got famine, um, hottest temperatures ever recorded, recently been broken. Wherever you look, the um, cost of disasters is going up, whether related disasters going up, whether it is through drought or floods or storm, or as in Portugal this week, the ground being so dry that fires break out. And this is a tweet from UNFCC this week, effectively saying that extreme temperatures that are, we're experiencing across Europe um, is a taste of what is to come. So if there's one thing I want you to leave from here thinking, that is the future about climate change is not going to be a gradual path to adaptation. It is a path to which these sorts of extremes we have to get much more used to, and they will affect in the long run the way that we farm. So just coming back to the tipping point of the overturning circulation, this is a map of just the amount of heat that it, it gives to us. A back of the envelope calculation suggests that if this turns off, Europe will, A, it will suffer longer, deeper winters, shorter growing seasons. It will change the storm track so we'll have more severe storms. Productivity across Europe would probably go down about 30% in terms of uh, uh, growth of plant productivity. Not only does it affect Europe, but the intertropical, intertropical convergence zone, which is effectively where hot and, cold, uh, hot and uh, cool, cool air meet together, and it creates the cyclones, uh, weather position and the cyclones and the monsoons, um, position of the monsoons, that will drop south. So that will mean that the monsoons might drop out of the rice-producing area. We'll get more desertification in sub-Saharan Africa, and even where soya comes from, the Cerrado, will dry out. So if you put all of those things together, perhaps a third, 25%, a quarter to a third of the world's productive capacity <coughs> might be switched off if this happens. And I just want to plant a thought in your mind. The 27-8-2010-2011 food price spikes um, the first one came from uh, a long drought in Australia, which is not a major producer of grain. It does produce grain. Uh, that accounted for about a third of 1% of global calorie production. A third of 1%. And the consequences of that, those food price spikes, is that we've had food riots that created the, the spark to the Arab Spring. We've had impacts in Syria... We've had flows, differences of flows of migration from Africa up to Europe. We've had the migration crisis in Europe and all of the domino effects, including radicalization and spread of, uh, of a whole host of things that we don't want to encompass every day, and Brexit. Those are all, in a sense, consequences of the loss of a third of 1% of global calorie production. If this happens and we lose a third of calorie production, a hundred times more. Imagine the sorts of global consequences that would come from the rationing of the calories that are produced to those that can afford it. It is quite a stimulating but frightening thought experiment to go through. So that's the background, that's climate change. What does climate change, what does climate do to agriculture? So I wrote a report many years ago, but I harvested these tables and the reason I'm putting this up here is not to overwhelm you with text, but to indicate that climate change and its impacts on agriculture is very complex and multifaceted. So it affects pollination. Clearly, if you're an apple grower, you know that. It clearly impedes access, rainfall impedes access to, um, to the land at the wrong sorts of times. It knocks over crops if it's hard enough uh, increases disease risk because it's in increasing humidity, and so on. Heat, drought, increased stress, those are the things that come to mind. High winds, lodging, loss of fruit, loss of uh, blossoms, 
um, changes in uh, the ability to move stuff around, whether it's inputs or, or harvest um, snow frost hail. Uh, pests and diseases, clearly, it's going to impact upon pests and diseases. And it's also going to interact with air pollution to create um, metabolic poisons, in effect, that uh, impede plant growth. So weather, you know, every farmer knows this, but very often we tend to forget it when we're talking about climate change. By changing the weather, climate change is going to change all of these different drivers. It's not just about getting drought-resistant re crops. It's about getting drought-resistant crops that are flood-resistant at the same time because those two things are, more, uh, are likely to increase simultaneously. Um, Clearly, at different times of the year, different activities are going to be more sensitive or less sensitive to different weather. And again, this is a table from that report in terms of clearly when um, flowers are just developing is a uh, critical time for temperature and so on. But it's not just, it's not just flowers. Um, also, sheep and cattle get affected. Um, and then... Changing temperatures clearly can impact a, ra a range of crop-related things in the summer, and they all spring to mind, but it will also impact upon crop-related things in the winter because a lot of, uh, a lot of um, uh, things require to have a cold period and then a hot period following, and if we lose the cold period, then that affects the, the way that the plants grow up. So some main messages for the UK... We are likely to have generally wetter winters and generally hotter, drier summers. And I can't emphasise the generally enough. Come back to that in a second. When it does rain, because of what I explained earlier about more energy in the atmosphere, when it does rain, it is likely to rain more heavily. So you're more likely to get lodging of crops, you're more likely to get loss of blossom, you're more likely to get um, uh, damage, hail, you're more likely to get flooding, and so on. All of those things come together. But the big caveat of this generally wetter, generally drier and hotter is that a lot of this depends on where the jet stream goes. Because even if generally it's getting hotter in the summer, if the jet stream's in the wrong place, it could get extremely hotter in the summer, or like 2012, it could get extremely dull and colder in the summer. So... We do not yet understand fully, and we certainly cannot predict whether we're going to be dominated by fluctuations in the jet stream position, or whether we can build on the expectation from previous work over the last decade or so that this pattern is going to dominate. My gut feeling is that the variability is going to dominate, and we're, on a day-to-day -day basis, not going to recognise that. And just to... to uh, put some kind of um, meat on the bones. What, I, what I've done in this graph is simulated a distribution, call this, I don't know, winter rainfall or something like that, of a current condition and a condition in future which is more variable. So in this, in the future, simulated experiment, the mean goes up. So on average, it gets drier. Sorry. It, on average, it gets drier. But because the variability is increasing, at the same time, there's a greater number of black dots here than here. So your chance of a reduction at the same time is also increasing. So it's perfectly possible to have a drier, on average, on average a drier summer, but also increase the risk of flooding. Or on average a wetter winter, but also increasing the risk of drought in winter. Those two things are perfectly compatible. And especially with the sensitivity on where the jet stream goes, I would certainly not bet, certainly in thinking in terms of capital investment like irrigation or other things that might have a 30 or 40 year life, I would not bet on the average dominating the patterns that you will experience rather than the day-to-day -day or year-to-year -year variability. Yeah, go on that. So how, how, the, how might this affect us? Well, this is a figure from uh, the UK Climate Change Risk Assessment. Uh, it's got a nice chapter that has a whole lot of stuff on agriculture in. 
Um, this is current land use classification or historical land use classification. And where it is bluer, that's the higher quality, more expensive land. As you can see, 2050, 2018, the grade one and grade two agricultural land becomes much rarer. And that is largely driven by soil quality driven through uh, rainfall and so on. So one thing is that the value of agricultural land is likely, likely to change because its capability to grow the crops is likely to change because of climate change. And then again, one of the messages that we've traditionally had about climate change is that the north will generally be fine the problems will largely be in the tropics. And the reason the north would generally be fine is that, as I showed earlier, we're putting lots of carbon into the atmosphere. And carbon, carbon dioxide, is clearly the building block of sugar. And photosynthesis turns carbon dioxide into sugar. So if you put more carbon in the plant's environment, you're effectively fertilizing it. You're making it easier for it to photosynthesize. And so that's called carbon dioxide fertilization. Our expectation is that in the north, we will get that boost to productivity from uh, carbon dioxide fertilization. And as long as our climate doesn't change too radically, then it should be good for northern um, productivity. And uh, this is some data from a uh, DEFRA project that was published a few years ago. And this effectively looks at that and says, well, yes, if you run the models based on your average climate, you would expect yields to go up. Um, uh, these are different sorts of models for wheat. Uh, yields to go up over the next century. But at the same time as yields going up, from the same report, you've got the incidence of fusarium as one example of a pest. The conditions get better, wetter winters. You get better conditions for aphids. So this is for um, a site, Camborne. Um, the predicted day of first emergen emergence goes down, so they emerge earlier in the spring. And because they grow very fast, they have lots of generations. By the end of the summer, number of generations before 31st of December, up to 30 generations. And because they grow so rapidly, you can imagine the potential there for, a for aphid-borne diseases and so on. And this is another example. This is for uh, lamb strike, fly strike in livestock. Again, what you can see is an increasing incidence of uh, vector-borne problems, insect-borne problems. So insects are not always good. They can often create a whole lot of hassles, as you can imagine. So the issue for UK agriculture is not just a rosy one, that we expect yields to go up through carbon dioxide fertilization, but we also expect pests and diseases to increase. And again, how are we going to cope with that? So what can we do? What can we do? Well, one of the things that the uh, Met Office is doing since we wrote our first report about extreme weather five or six years ago, they've got really switched on to this issue of how will weather impact upon us and how, how can we predict the kind of 10-year activity of climate um, and they have put a lot of effort into thinking about decadal forecasting. And so that's not going to say, well, in 2023, you're going to have a drought in Thetford. What it will say is that over the next 10 years, you've got a 30% probability of having a drought or a 20% probability. And then over the 10 years after that, you're going to have a 40% probability. So that sort of thing. So effectively, that's taking the climate models, running them on a very, very small scale so they capture the weather at a local level, running them ahead for 10 years and seeing what they're doing. And also the Met Office is putting a lot of effort into seasonal forecasting in terms of being able to say at the start of the year, this is likely to be a cold, wet summer, or next summer is likely to be a cold, wet summer versus a very hot summer. So I think as we get better at predicting, that will certainly help us do a whole lot of um, differential planning and it will also help when it comes to interrelationships with uh, retailers for example if the supermarkets know that they're going to have a uh, it's going to be a good year they can make a much better forecast about their demand for strawberries or uh, other soft fruits so that when it comes to producing them uh, at the end of the summer uh, during the summer 
you know, they've already encouraged people to produce them. If the weather then changes and it becomes like 2012 and no one wants to buy strawberries, then that creates a whole lot of issues for the, for the sector. So seasonal and decadal forecasting will help. And clearly there is a lot of research going on about how to cope with changing climate or changing weather. It's more changing climate than changing weather. So there's a lot of research. Uh, I've spent a lot of time working with BBSRC over the last few years. There's a lot of research going on the, on the genetics of um, pest, um, pest resistance or the genetics of um, yield, resist uh, yield growth or the genetics of photosynthesis efficiency or the genetics of um, drought resistance and so on. And I just cut and pasted a, um, a bit of a... Um, timetable from a meeting recently just to give you a kind of flavour of the sorts of things that BBSRC is funding. Um, there is also a fair amount of research going on thinking about not crops and their response to a particular driver but farming systems as a whole and how they might respond. So one of the things that's also driving this is a European pesticides uh, regulations and losing pesticides from the catalogue and that is being driven by consumers, so getting out of Europe is not going to suddenly put lots of pesticides back into the catalogue. If we are moving towards a low pesticide world, how do we manage? How can we enhance the natural capabilities of small wasps and stuff to uh, do our pest control for free most of the time and use pesticides less often? Um, so that's kind of farming system research, but there's quite a lot of that going on. Um, Clearly, there's lots of research on farm machinery. This is one of my favourites. This is um, uh, from Harper Adams. This is an autonomous uh, vehicle that has an image recognition system, um, and it can just go around and spray um, individual plants, individual weeds, because it recognises them rather than spray the whole field. But one of the reasons that this is a small autonomous vehicle is being driven by the fact that increasingly it might, be get, it might become difficult to get large vehicles on the land if we are increasingly variable in our rain. So there might be periods, months of the year, where very large machines and the growth of machinery over the last 20 or 30 years is getting to the point where it's becoming a hindrance rather than a help if the weather is changing a lot. Um, there's quite a lot of work going on about, certainly under the government's animal health plan, um, about surveillance mechanisms and building up networks of surveillance to be able to predict disease um, uh, as it changes with response to climate change. And there's a lot of work going on about farming systems for resilience. But one of the things that I, I, I want to emphasise, again, is this variability that the weather is changing. If you kind of take, so this is wheat yields, if you imagine into the future the variability keeps on increasing, then in the old days where we could predict what the summer was going to be and we had a pretty good expectation that we were going to have an average summer and even if it was not an average summer, it would bear some relationship to the summer, to, to the average, then if you have a kind of good idea of what you can expect, then you can, as a farmer or any other sort of risk-averse creature, work to that expectation. And if you work to that expectation and say, it's going to be a year of this particular characteristic, so you can plant the crops at the times that match those characteristics. And if instead you're a, somebody who doesn't believe um, in the forecast for the average and you want to plant a whole range of different crops to say, well, if it's a wet summer, I want to prefer these, or if it's a dry summer, I want to prefer doing this, or if it's an early summer or a late summer, etc. You might pr pr uh, plant a whole range of different things. In a good year, you would typically get less income, you'll get less yields overall. But as variability increases, there are lots of theoretical reasons for expecting, in very highly variable times, the individual that bet hedges that's what it's called in technical terms, the individual that bet hedges will end up doing better. It's trading off the mean for the variance. Managing the variance costs. If you can predict the mean, you don't have to manage the variance. But if you can't predict the mean, and it might be a hot year or a cold year or a dry year or a wet year or some combination, all of them, and you want to manage all of those sorts of things, 
So there might be, as variability in the weather increases, there might come a point where it makes rational economic sense to switch out of large-scale uh, simple rotation agriculture into growing a whole range of different um, systems or working with much more agroecological principles underpinning a whole range of different things to cope with the variability. So the climate change in terms of the variability doesn't have to have technical solutions in terms of making the crops that we currently grow more resistant to those variable situations. There will come a point when the variability drives us to select different crops planted at different times so we can access them in different ways that have different susceptibilities to pests and diseases and so on. So we would expect over time a general increase in um, variability at the farm level as well as at the weather level. So all I've spoken about so far has been climate and climate's impact on the weather. I just want to spend the last 10 minutes re rehearsing the argument going the other way and why this is important for the future of farming. So we have a food system, and a food system encompasses agriculture, its impact upon the environment, food goes into some, retail, uh, some supply chain, ends up in a retail environment, we choose it, it impacts our nutrition, health and well-being, but our well-being is impacted by the environment. That's what I mean by the food system. And what, we've, what has happened over the last 30 or 40 years is that we have invested huge amounts of money making agricultural production highly efficient. The whole industrialization of agriculture has been based on public subsidies as well as changing kind of trade regulations. We've got hugely efficient agriculture at this end might not be as efficient as it could be, but it's very hugely efficient. But the result of producing very, very large amounts of food very cheaply is that we have a hugely inefficient food system. The agricultural production at this end, and this is the G20 meeting I've been in in Berlin for the last couple of days, the agricultural efficiency at this end means that lots of people waste food, lots of people eat too much food, people are ill, and the environment is getting degraded. The whole system as a whole is inefficient because it's being driven by the efficiency of that. If food price is so low that it's easy to waste, it makes a rational sense to waste it rather than go and recycle it or, or eat it or plan. You find food in your fridge and you throw it away and buy something else because it's so cheap to do. Then that is an interesting uh, uh, um, situation to be in. So our $519 billion subsidy a year in commodity crops has driven the situation that you're all familiar with. And of the crops that are consumed, over 50% of the, the calories come from wheat, rice, and maize. And if you get, add the other four, five, gets you up to 76% of the calories. Huge, huge concentration, concentration of risk in space, as I mentioned earlier. And a result of this is that when you look at what people are eating around the world, this is a statistical map of uh, countries' diets. Each dot is a country's diet in statistical space. And what you can see is a map. So different po points further apart are dissimilar. Points close together are similar. Over my lifetime, so again from the 60s onwards, the space that is occupied by countries' diets is shrinking. We're all eating more or less the same thing because we're all growing more or less the same thing and we're relying on a few spots to create them. And as a result of us all eating calorie-rich but nutrient-poor diets, this is um, global data published last year. There's lots of country-specific data. Um, these are different sizes of people from underweight to very, very overweight at the top. But if you now look, that green arrow, under 50% of the world's population is now of a healthy weight. And obesity is now classed as a disease because it has many of the molecular properties of other diseases caused by microbes and so on. Um, malnourishment mal, bad, nourishment, nourishment, malnourishment 
is increasingly recognised to encompass obesity and overweight and the diseases caused by those just as much as the diseases caused by malnutrition in the sense of underweight, undernutrition. So we have a food system that concentrate risk in a few small areas, in a few crops, creates a diet that has become globalised where 50% of the world's population is not healthy in eating. And as I mentioned earlier, food is now so cheap that uh, it is, makes much more sense to throw it away rather than to use it wisely. Um, and that has been occupying a lot of our thinking time over the last few days in, in, in Berlin. But the f total food production in sub-Saharan Africa is about what we throw away in Europe and North America each year. And in a sense, if that's not an economic issue, which it clearly could be an economic issue because of the money embodied in it, the water embodied in it, the soils, etc., embodied in it, it is certainly a bit of a moral issue. But to come back to the climate change, this figure from a recent paper looks at the greenhouse gases emitted, not per industrial sector, but per the services that we use in the home. And greenhouse gases from agriculture and food, almost a third of global emissions, about the same as lighting, car use, aeroplanes for domestic purposes, washing machines which are terribly energy expensive, and uh, heating and cooling. So when we think about what's driving climate change, it's not cars, it's not aeroplanes, it's not light bulbs, it's not heating, it's not washing machines, it is agriculture and food. And as the rest of the world, all of these sectors, are reducing their environmental footprint, their greenhouse gas footprint, fairly fast, it is making the, the obviousness of agriculture and foods emissions much, much greater. So the future is going to be about dealing with agriculture and food. If we don't do anything, if we carry on as we are for the next 20 or 30 years, then agriculture and food alone will use up all of the carbon budget for the Paris Climate Agreement. So if it uses up all of the Paris climate carbon budget, that kind of locks us into not a two-degree world, because that's agriculture and food alone is a two-degree world, a three- or four-degree world. And if we get to a three- or four-degree world, as I explained earlier, not only do you have the gradual change of England to Spain, but you also have the real incident, incidents of extreme weather, and you also have the tipping points situation. So if we carry on as we are, we increase climate change, and then we increase the, the way that climate change impacts on agriculture, and that will reduce yields, so we will need more land and more intensification, and that will produce more greenhouse gases, and that becomes a vicious circle, unless we do something about that. And there is a lot of literature, most of you will have heard of bits and pieces of it, there's a lot of literature that actually the best and easiest way to change agricultural emissions is not to change the efficiency of agriculture. That has to be done, for sure. But the best way of doing it is to change the demand for agricultural produce by changing the diet. So, just as an example, and I won't dwell on it, people can ask me later if they want to, this is where it's red. This is um, calories grown for livestock. Where it is green, it's calories grown for people. The calories that are fed to livestock could feed the entire population of Asia in terms of calories. We've got enough calories on the world, in the world already to feed 12 billion people or so. So we don't, as the human population grows, we don't necessarily have to increase the amount of food. And just to emphasize that, this is a nice study. It uh, does an experiment where it says, imagine the land area of the United States. Let's say uh, the land area of the United States. It doesn't involve itself in international trade. How many people could it feed if they ate different things? At the moment, the baseline is 400 million people, because that's about what the United States has. If you change the diets, and this is, roughly speaking, going more ve vegetarian, and this is vegan at this end, you can double the population supported by the land area of the United States 
by changing the diet. So if you think about, rather than land area, if you think about also um, greenhouse gas emissions or water requirements or impact upon biodiversity, by changing our diets, we could halve the impact upon the environment. So there are a lot of people in governments, in the industry, um, in civil society, who effectively say we have got ourselves into a situation where our production system drives a lot of unsustainability in the, in the pursuit of cheap food. That creates a lot of waste overconsumption, climate change, etc., etc., etc. And we kind of expect it because food is cheap. We expect ever more of that. But when you look at the loss factors, and there was a, a really nice recent paper, which I haven't referenced here, but if about a third of the world's food is lost and about a third of the world's food is fed to livestock that doesn't need to be and about a third of the world's population is overweight to the extent that it is, the efficiency of our food system is only about 40 to 50%. So if we were going to design a food system that was sustainable and healthy and delivered all of the things that we need, it would be a system that was based on less waste, healthy consumption, low environmental impact, but instead of externalizing the cost of food to the health system and the environment, we paid the full cost of food and the full value of food. And again, I'm, you might think I am all so wacky as an ecologist wearing sandals, but we were talking about this in the G20 meeting I've just come from. This is becoming mainstream in terms of thinking. How do we recognize the full value and the full cost of producing food so that we don't produce food in an unsustainable way for health or the environment and end up with a system of sustainable production. So I just want to flag up one or two small things. The Paris Climate Agreement, so everybody's heard of the SDGs, I won't dwell on that. The Paris Climate Agreement had these two consequences for food. The first one is that food has to play its role in meeting Paris, which implies a change in diets, as I've suggested. The second one is that to keep to below two degrees, given the way that we're already emitting greenhouse gases at this time, and the speed with which we are stopping emitting greenhouse gases, that if we are going to hit the two degrees by the end of the century, in the second half of the century, we're going to have to suck carbon from the atmosphere because we're putting too much in for a two-degree world now. So we're going to have to take some back out. And the way of taking some back out that is most popular at the moment is biomass, energy, carbon capture and storage, BECS, as a negative emissions technology. But this is from the OECD, IEA, World Energy Outlook. This is just a projection of how much land will be needed to capture the carbon by the end of the century. If the red dotted line is about what we're probably going to hit if we're lucky, eight million square kilometers of land to meet the Paris Climate Agreement is what we'll need. Eight million square kilometers, for those of you who are not nerds, is 58% of the entire global arable area. So, yeah, <laughs> you might laugh, but it won't be the arable area that will be needed, it'll be a marginal land. But the issue of, the, so, so the FAO's food security stuff of a decade ago, we must double food production, whatever the cost, is now off the agenda. The agenda is now, we have to make our diets better, we have to make our diets healthier, we have to deal with waste and not overproduce and throw it all away. We have to change agriculture because we can't expand the land because the land is going to be taken away from agriculture. So we have to go into this 50% of the inefficiency of the food system to free up enough land to deal with climate change. And that makes a radical difference for the way that we think about our food systems. Bless him. Um, I won't talk about... <laughs> oh, it's, it's far too late in the evening to talk about the World Economic Forum. Um, we did, we did some scenarios analysis, um, and there is a web, uh, uh, the report's on the web. 
But effectively, we said in the scenarios analysis, we said, what are the things that we know and what are the things that we don't know? And we know that the world's going to get richer and we know that climate's going to happen and et cetera, et cetera. The two things that we thought were most unknowable but plausible and game changers were these two axes that we switch from largely unsustainable and healthy diets to largely sustainable and healthy diets for the reasons I've talked about. And the other axis is that we go from an increasing free trade globalization situation to much more local or regional markets. Now, this axis might be driven by protectionism and Trump or geopolitics, or it might be driven by the fact that we can't rely on global supply chains so much because of climate change impacts, or it might be driven by a whole range of different things, including people who want to eat more local and lovely food. And in each one of these, so, so I presented this in Davos this year, and I had a meeting with the head of Cargill, head of Monsanto, head of Unilever, head of Nestle, and about eight other people. And all of those people said, we do not want to be in the business as usual box in 20 years' time. We want to be somewhere over here, supporting healthy diets, supporting a sustainable food system. We want to get out of that as fast as we possibly can. The question is, how do we get out of that? But again, I haven't got time to talk about it. But I just want to, I just want to highlight what these two, if we're eating sustainably with local supply chains versus eating sustainably with global supply chains, what that might mean to agriculture for us. So these different futures have very different technological needs. If we go for a globally interconnected free trade world, then we must continue to rely on commodity crops. And to get the health, we would typically, because it's the cheapest way of doing it, engineer in more nutrients, biofortification. So this is a kind of GM world connected globally, producing lots of ultra-processed food that has greater nutritional characteristics. Conversely, if you're in a more disconnected local or regional world, what that implies is that you can't rely on the global supply chains, so you have to grow more different things locally. So you have a different diversity of local production. And because you're losing the efficiency of the global supply chain, your local production doesn't produce as much, so you have to have also at the same time a very low waste culture. And to make that work, you have to have whole of government thinking, so you have to have an agricultural system designed for nutrition and health and a su subsidy system to support that all working together that people can afford, afford more expensive food by not having to pay taxes to pay the healthcare costs of having um, a whole range of uh, illnesses associated. So I was in Scotland recently in the Parliament. They are talking about a Good Food Nation, nation bill based on driving local and lovely. Morrison Supermarket, I did a report for them earlier in the year, are thinking about how to incentivise local supply chains because they can see it's a way of making the situation better rather than worse, relying on global um, supply chains and all of the risks associated with it. So, as a, as a climate person and as an environmentalist and a food systems person and an agriculturalist, we keep a few sheep, um, I would say to anybody in the farming community, don't bet on the future being business as usual and don't necessarily bet on the future being increasing globalization and increasing reliance on commodity crops because of if we do that, we drive ourselves into a ratchet of climate change and all the rest of that. So think about where you might want to sit, not next year or the year after, this is decades. But the one thing about policy that I've learned in my years of gov across government is that policy changes, nothing can happen for decades, then something might happen very suddenly and the environment might change. And we've got a bit of that this week, and la this week last week and last year in that things have changed very rapidly. And I could imagine a situation where we drop out of Brexit talks, we drop out into a WTO stuff, our trade relationships are really quite painful, and then there is an awful lot of incentives 
to move in this direction because we can rely on that over the next few years because we can upregulate our local production even if we can't trade <coughs> effectively with anybody other than the United States. So you could imagine or something like a Middle East war disrupting our supply chains and what do we do if we've disrupted our supply chains and so on. So conclusions, sorry I'm drivelling, drivelling on and on and on. This is the uh, Morrison's report, if anybody wants to do, look at that. It's just a, a, a look at some of the arguments for and against globalisation of our food system. Climate change is likely to impact, absolutely. But the variability of weather, perhaps being the bigger driver than the climate change, even over the long term. There is a significant need to adapt and adapt not just in the sense of how do you get more drought resistant wheat, but adapt in terms of the whole farming system to build resilience against simultaneous floods and droughts. Um, climate change will impact the UK food market through not just the climate here, but the climate around the whole world and what people want from food and how that supply can be met. So there will be a whole range of different things that will change incentives. So changing our trade structure might well change the incentives for growing different things in different ways. Um, in the medium to long term, the mounting costs for food, uh, for, from food onto environment and health are likely to come together and drive either from bottom up, and we're starting to see as with the pushing away from pesticides, from, from the bottom up from, from citizens or from top down because we can't afford the costs of ill health from, de, uh, Ill health from food and ill health from climate change. Um, those th things are likely to come together to drive a deliberative policy-led attempt to change diets. And if we change diets, that immediately has an impact for agriculture. Whether it is our agriculture or somebody else's agriculture depend on our trade relationships. So again, Trade is a huge determinant of what goes on in the UK. So it might imply growing different things in different ways. And so thinking about farming and adaptation to climate change involves all of these systemic things about what is food agriculture for. Agriculture is not just for producing an agricultural economy. It is also for producing a sustainable, healthy diet. Okay, thank you very much.